Now, I, I suspect you all know that this is, of course, of forbidden delights. Because we are going to be looking at what is not allowed to be looked at, or what is considered to be uh, so inappropriate as not to be something you can even think of considering, namely the philosophy of nature, not the philosophy of science. Now, once upon a time, the science of nature, that is the thinking apprehension of, of, of nature was the philosophy of nature, there was no distinction. But in modern times, at least since early modern times, uh, a science of nature has set itself apart from philosophy. And in recent times, in those corners of academia that have come to prevail institutionally, what could be called the undertakers of philosophy have come to regard the philosophy of nature as something that in a way could be regarded as um, a meaningless enterprise. That basically all philosophy can do is engage in a philosophy of empirical sciences. That is to say, when it comes to attempting to provide knowledge of determinate objects Reason is utterly powerless to provide any cognition of its own. It instead has to hand over all attempts to know determinate subject matter to those sciences that are guided by observation. And all philosophy can do is reflect on the operations of such sciences. And since reason is regarded as something that is incapable of generating any, any new content of its own, let alone of relating conceptual determinations to anything else, uh, all that philosophy can do in reflecting upon the results of empirical observation, those attempts to find something universal in empirical observations, is to certify to what degree the terms employed to uh, in some regard, organize the data, are coherent, are consistently applied, and so forth. And as for reason itself, well, it can look at itself, and what it looks at when it looks at itself is an utterly formal scaffold that can be understood in terms of a formal logic, which regards thought as not having any intrinsic content as always, being about matters that have to be found elsewhere. Therefore, the logic of thinking is formal in character. It's a logic of thinking any content whatsoever, insofar as there are no contents intrinsic to thought. And for that reason, all thought can know in understanding itself is its formal identity. That is, that it is as one with itself in whatever content it is engages in thinking, but thought has no power to generate any contents of its own, to relate different contents to one another, be they conceptual or non-conceptual, or to secure any relationship between thought determinations and what is other than thought. Now, that is, in effect, the prevailing view that's particularly potent, supposedly, when it comes to regarding nature. There are no courses in the philosophy of nature. There are only courses in the philosophy of science. Now, this reduction of reason to this empty scaffold, and this reduction of philosophy to, in a sense, an exercise of analysis of empirical givens or empirically available linguistic usage is itself incoherent because it is making a very non-formal claim about the status of reason, about the inability of reason to uh, do anything more than be an operation of formal self-identity. Here a positive claim is being made about what reason is, what reason can or cannot do. And such a claim which is being offered without qualification 
is something that the reasoning question so described ought to be incapable of making. Nevertheless, uh, the uh, abandonment of reason you know, maybe something that can never be coherently um, put forward. You know, that is to say, um, one can never be cured of the urge to do philosophy. But the fact that one can never be cured of doing philosophy doesn't mean that reason can apprehend what nature is. Now, there has been a tendency, as you know, to not only regard reason as empty and powerless and to regard philosophy as a vain enterprise, but there has been a tendency to treat philosophy as if it were just another positive science, a positive science in the nature of natural science, in the nature of empirical science, it's positive in the sense that on the one hand, it addresses a given subject matter whose character is taken for granted, and at the same time, Positive science not only presupposes what it is investigating, but it's presupposing that it has access to what it is investigating. Now, these dual presuppositions, namely of the method one employs and of the boundaries of the subject matter, you know, might appear to be um, inescapable. Since, after all, if one doesn't have any given determinacy to confront or any given access to it, it's not clear how one can begin with anything determinate with any positive science. Well, with any determinate science, any determinate inquiry. But of course, the mere fact that any positive science operates with these dual presuppositions of the contents of its subject matter and of its method or access to its subject matter means that all its results are doubly conditioned, doubly relative to whatever boundaries it begins with, with whatever preconceptions of its subject matter it begins with, and with whatever uh, methodology it embraces, or whatever access it presumes to have with regard to its subject matter. So in this regard, positive sciences remain in a realm of opinion, or at least in the realm of a relative uh, enterprise that can never purport to make any unqualified claims about anything. Now, philosophers have been unable to uh, be satisfied with, uh, let's say, the labors of the opinion of positive science. They have not been able to take the boundaries of their subject matter for granted nor to take for granted their access to what it is they should be uh, addressing. Because after all, these are themselves philosophical questions. What philosophy itself should be addressing is as much a philosophical problem as is what approach philosophy should take, and properly so, because if philosophy, after all, is going to try to get at truth without qualification, it cannot make presuppositions about its subject matter or about its method. These are themselves matters that philosophy must establish through its own labors. And all philosophy has been uh, driven, in a sense, with this recognition that uh, philosophy has to be autonomous as opposed to heteronomous, as opposed to beholden to uh, given and given authority. 